Design, What Scientific Difference Could It Make? by Del Ratz. Abstract. The claim that intelligent design theories are not legitimately scientific and that such theories can carry no genuinely scientific content represent conventional anti-design wisdom. However, actual supports for such claims come to remarkably little and tend to implode under scrutiny. Furthermore, demands confronting design theories are often arbitrarily restricted to the realm of direct empirical consequences. The precise surface level empirical upshot of design theories is, I think, still relatively minimal. But the direct empirical level does not exhaust the substance of science, and design theories may bring to science deeper cognitive richness, broader conceptual resources, and more substantive anchors than a purely methodologically naturalistic science can achieve. Intelligent design has become a focus of hot, even blistering debate. Not all critics agree on the exact nature of the outrage it perpetrates, but high on the list of charges are one, that the very concept of intelligent design when applied to nature itself inescapably constitutes reference to supernatural design, a reference whose illegitimacy some apparently feel is far beyond dispute, and two, that even were the concept of intelligent design legitimate, in some philosophical sense, it would simply have no empirical scientific bite. In what follows, I wish to do three things. First, I will argue that in principle, the concept of intelligent design can be legitimately applied to what we would ordinarily take to be natural phenomena. Second, I will explore some issues concerning the recognition of design. Third, I will argue that although design may not cut the swath its advocates claim for it, it does have scientifically interesting potential. Whether that potential is, or is likely to become actual, I will not address. I will proceed by glossing the most popular critiques of design in each of the three areas, then briefly explore resources available to design advocates in those areas. Legitimacy, the principal question. 1. Definition. The concept of intelligent design is frequently ruled out of the natural sciences on the grounds that if the concept is applied to nature, the only relevant designer would have to be some supernatural being, reference to whom is scientifically forbidden. This prohibition is sometimes justified by appeal to some definition or rule of science, typically methodological naturalism, which is frequently characterized as follows. The view that nature is the whole of reality, philosophical naturalism, may or may not be correct. Science itself simply takes no position. But since science cannot deal with the supernatural, it is an essential methodological principle of science that science must proceed as if philosophical naturalism is correct. In practice, methodological naturalism involves a provisional acceptance of a separability thesis, an assumption that the natural realm can be separated from the immaterial, e.g. mind or God, at some level below which it can be treated as autonomous in a scientifically relevant sense, given suitable structural and organisational principles, or that there is some level of behaviour and organisation in nature below which mind and agency are not scientifically relevant. Design, on this view, is suspect since it represents a potential denial of separability. But separability is a substantive thesis whose truth and essentiality to science require argument. And even were it true, determining where the relevant levels lie would be scientifically crucial, perhaps non-trivial, and might itself require recognition of the presence or absence of mind or agency involvement. But if science could do that, the case for barring design would be substantially undercut. Although methodological naturalism may be a valuable strategic principle, 
elevating it to a definitional principle generates nasty problems. Should it turn out that naturalism does not constitute the whole relevant story of some scientific domain, then commitment to methodological naturalism will guarantee that the scientific picture generated in that domain would inescapably be either incomplete or simply mistaken. In short, if nature does not bow to our stipulations, science risks difficulty. Furthermore, attempts to triumph definitionally are complicated by the fact that no one has a compelling definition of science, that most demarcation attempts are deep in some twilight zone, and that attempts to settle substantive issues via a a priori definitional trumping do not seem consistent with the image of science even most scientists maintain. 2. Unfalsifiability It is widely claimed that design hypotheses are unfalsifiable and consequently scientifically illegitimate. Falsification of design hypotheses would indeed be a tricky business. Virtually any proposed empirical criterion for non-design could be deliberately contrived by a resourceful designer. Thus, attempts to prove that a specific phenomenon was not designed would be virtually hopeless. More generally, this criticism frequently rests on the idea that design attempts are scientifically empty, being reconcilable with absolutely everything. This hyperflexibility charge, however, requires caution. There have been multitudinous novel empirical discoveries, but relatively few theoretical revolutions, which suggest that even respectable scientific theories are flexible enough to adjust to a wide range of unanticipated phenomena. Even in cases where alleged novel empirical phenomenon is subsequently scientifically repudiated, claims for its very existence being abandoned, during the initial period of provisional acceptance, there may even be multiple theoretical proposals for accommodating it within a reigning theory. Could there be evidence against design adequate for scientific purposes? I see no reason why not. If we had empirical evidence that the history of human evolution really was a random drunk walk, then although absence of design would not be entailed, the case for lack of design, in that specific matter, would seem to be scientifically defensible. That is not only adequate, but perhaps as good as could be demanded. In any case, unfalsifiability does not imply the absence of relevance and impact. 3. Non-predictiveness Closely intertwined with the unfalsifiability issue is a charge that intelligent design is non-predictive. This issue, however, is not so straightforward as often thought. First, it is generally recognised that scientific theories make predictions only in conjunction with other inferential resources, boundary conditions, auxiliary hypotheses, instrumentation theories, etc. Second, Different scientifically essential principles operate at different levels in a conceptual hierarchy within science, at different degrees of removal from the empirical trenches. What connection a conceptual component should have with empirical predictions is partially a function of the level upon which it operates. Further, science unavoidably rests in part upon a conceptual matrix of deep metaphysical presuppositions. Such principles must generate some payoff in the broader scientific picture, but that payoff is not always so simple as particular identifiable empirical predictions. Design theories might find their legitimacy deeply enough within the structure of science to make demands for specific empirical predictions inappropriate. Such theories might, for instance, constitute key parts of a conceptual matrix whose payoff is more subtle, more contextual. Thus, what does or does not count as a fatal difficulty for design theories will depend upon the exact nature and level of such theories. 
Although space precludes discussion here, it is worth noting that virtually every accusation in this area raised against design theories applies equally to the uniformity of nature, a principle whose scientific propriety few would care to challenge. And on, although other principal objections to design theories in science also have been raised, I think that it can be shown that none of the objections withstand scrutiny. In fact, there are considerations which suggest some degree of legitimacy for design theories. One cluster of such follows briefly. 4. Aliens The concept of intelligent alien design is certainly scientifically legitimate, and that fact has implications often not recognised. There is no rule in science requiring either that life on Earth began here, or that theories concerning the origin of life on Earth be restricted in that manner. In fact, a number of prominent scientists, like Fred Hoyle, Francis Crick, have argued that life could not have arisen naturally under prevailing early Earth conditions and time constraints, and that life consequently had to have come here from elsewhere. It is at least possible in that case that life was specifically engineered for Earth conditions, that life as we know it is an artefact of intelligent design and agency. There is nothing inherently unscientific in that view, nor in the idea that if life as we know it is a designed artefact, then it is in principle possible for us to discover that fact through empirical investigation. This line of reasoning can be extended further. It has been suggested by various physicists, e.g. Andre Linde, Edward Harrison, that technologically advanced cultures might develop the capability of generating bubble universes. Advanced technology might even allow specification of natural, physical parameters inside such universes, generating what could appear inside such a universe to be cosmic fine-tuning, or possibly even a deliberately constructed message. There seems little a priori reason for thinking that creatures developed within such a universe, perhaps as deliberately intended results of specification of the bubble's parameters, would necessarily be unable to determine the artifactual status of their universe. Prohibitions against scientific application of the concept of design either to phenomena within what we normally think of as nature, or to that nature itself, seem thus mistaken, so long as cosmic artisans are natural, in some broader sense, the idea that our universe, our nature, is intelligently designed, and that empirical investigation can reveal that fact, is in principle scientifically legitimate. 5. Extensions. Two related considerations extend the implications even further. First, it is commonly observed that the identity of the artisan or artisans should make little difference. In the movie 2001, recognition of the monolith as designed was independent of any knowledge of the identity, character or intentions of the designer, or of the means of production. Indeed, we would have identified the monolith as designed even had its artisan been supernatural. It cannot be seriously maintained that one cannot admit within science that something is designed unless one knows or assumes that the designer is not supernatural. Even if it is illegitimate to consider the supernatural within science, obviously designed phenomena, e.g. a bulldozer, could still be legitimately recognised as designed even if the designer was in fact supernatural. Second, sealing off science from recognition of the supernatural may not be trivial. Whether an investigation is scientifically legitimate is surely independent of what ultimate results the investigation generates. Otherwise, one would not know whether to apply to NSF or NEH until after one's investigation were completed, a clearly intolerable situation for everyone concerned. 
one possible outcome of relevant investigation would be that the universe, or life as we know it, was an artifact, and that the artisan was, or were, technologically advanced natural beings. The investigation could surely be scientific, and if the identity of the artisan, as natural or alien, were legitimately scientific, then at least according to Popperians, the latter part of that conclusion would have to be empirically falsifiable, i.e. it would have to be in principle empirically demonstrable that the artisan was or were not technologically advanced natural beings. Were that shown, options concerning the identity of the artisan would be seriously restricted. Indeed, the conclusion that the artisan was or were supernatural would be very close to entailed. That would, of course, constitute an additional challenge to the separability thesis. One related concern will emerge later. I will not pursue this legitimacy issue further here, but if considerations like those above do not establish the scientific, in principle, permissibility of intelligent design theories, they at least suggest that the opposite conclusion is far from unchallengeable. Recognition, the practical question. Such legitimacy would be of little significance were there no reliable means of detecting or recognizing design when it was manifested. What design recognition procedures are available to us and could any of them apply even in principle to natural phenomena? 1. Counterflow and artifacts. We tacitly recognize design almost non-stop in the normal course of things, in physical, conceptual and behavioral artifacts. Design recognition is essential even in various sciences, from the social to such semi-hard sciences as anthropology, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, and some forensic sciences. However, the recognition process in virtually all relevant instances rests upon recognition that some aspects of the phenomenon in question exhibit counterflow. Characteristics which nature, unaided by agency, does not, would not, or even could not produce. SETI, for instance, looks initially for signals of a type, pattern, or frequency not likely attributable to natural processes. Attempts to understand Stonehenge began with the trivial recognition that it was an artifact and not a product of natural processes. That is the basic pattern of familiar cases of design recognition, a preliminary recognition of counterflow and artifactuality. Our typical dependence on counterflow generates a potential difficulty with attempts to recognize design in or of nature. Since absence of familiar counterflow and artifactuality seems to be precisely what characterizes nature as nature, things we find in nature are exactly what nature does, would and can do. Could we then ever recognize design in nature? 2. Cognitive resonance. Design recognition does not depend solely, or perhaps at all in some cases, upon recognition of counterflow. What signals design, as opposed to just artifactuality, is that designed phenomena typically manifest some characteristic that resonates with our recognition. Even the most ordinary cases of design involve more than merely something nature would not do. Being deliberately agent generated, they typically involve something that an agent 
a mind would do. That is the heart of the concept of design. And that characteristic, in principle, can be recognised independent of recognition of counterflow and can exist independent of counterflow itself. 3. Designer Psychology But recognition of design in nature solely on the basis of cognitive resonance seems problematic. Surely, what an agent or a mind would do depends crucially on the type of agent mind in question. And once outside the realm of human design, we apparently have no experience whatever, much less a basis for a respectable induction. What, for instance, might be the standard Alpha Centurion psychological profile? What aims and values and concepts might such creatures have? Would any of those things overlap with ours? Or how would we know what a supernatural agent would be inclined to do? Or what sorts of design an utterly infinite mind would find appealing? These are, of course, question types rooted in Hume and which flowered in Darwin. Those are serious but not necessarily fatal questions. For one thing, there might be common constraints governing any natural intelligence, or any physically based intelligence. Indeed, SETI research tacitly employs that assumption in determining what microwave bands to pay particular attention to. For example, arguments for the so-called waterhole search principle involves assumptions concerning not only alien capabilities, but alien broadcast band selection strategies. With a supernatural designer, however, such constraints might be absent. But within Judeo-Christian theology, there are further potentially significant resources. First is the doctrine that humans are created in the image of God. The exact character and implications of that doctrine are disputed, but to the extent that it bears upon structures of human cognition, it may provide a basis for recognition of at least some instances of supernatural design. In fact, science itself depends on nature's intelligibility to us, which may in its turn depend upon structures in our cognition imaging structures in God's wisdom, which he built into creation. Second is the traditional view that humans were created to be knowing things. That opens the possibility of our having inbuilt resources, allowing recognition of design, whether that design be human and alien design involving counterflow and artifactuality or supernatural design in nature involving neither of those properties. 4. Design recognition faculties. Is there reason to think that we do have such capabilities? Oddly enough, Darwin himself, in the last year of his life, testified that a conviction of design in nature often comes over me with overwhelming force. It was a conviction that happened to him, not an inference or choice or anything else of his own doing. The contemporary biologist Francis Crick sees this intuitive tilt toward involuntary design convictions as pervasive and powerful enough to necessitate posting warnings for biologists. He cautions, biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed, but rather evolved. The idea that we have an inbuilt design recognition ability can be found in William Huell and is mentioned in David Hume, but it is most explicitly explored in the 18th century Scottish common sense philosopher Thomas Reed. According to Reed, our basic recognition of design, in particular 
of certain properties as marks or signs of design does not involve prior experience, induction or inference of any sort, but is ultimately involuntary and perceptual, roughly paralleling ordinary sensory perception. As a consequence of the constitution of our nature, certain sensory events trigger in us particular cognitive states, including not only direct recognition of and convictions concerning trees and other humans, but also recognition of and convictions concerning design. Although I will not go into it here, I think that Reed's view is plausibly defensible. He at least seems to be right that in our ordinary, everyday recognition and identification of human design, spoons, chairs, space shuttles, we do not engage in inference, calculate probabilities, or anything of the sort. I suspect that we have little clue as to what some of the relevant probabilities even are. In fact, we sometimes appear able to directly and immediately recognize design in objects wholly beyond our previous experiences. And we presume that we would recognize as designed at least some alien artifacts whose very categories lie outside the experience of any human being. But if something like a Reedian view is right, then recognition of design might have a legitimate claim to being observational, and at least in this respect, to being potential, potentially as legitimate in science and as reliable as our other perceptual matters. Differences the pragmatic question. Suppose, then, that reference to design is in principle legitimate in natural science, and that we could in principle recognise some occurrences in nature were such present. Would it make any real difference to science? It might initially appear that it would not. Two sets of considerations follow. One, Inferences to and from design. There are two categories of design inference that require separation. Inference to design and inference from design. Inferences to design involve moving from particular empirical data to the conclusion that the phenomenon in question is a result, directly or indirectly, of deliberate design. Such inferences would require something like bridge principles, stipulating that the relevant empirical characteristics indicate designness. Establishing such connections in certain situations is unproblematic. We do so routinely every day. Unfortunately, as noted earlier, the everyday clear cases typically involve counterflow, and counterflow is precisely what is systematically missing, or at least bitterly contestable, in the cases of interest in natural science. Significantly weakening any inductive case for the crucial bridge principles are the facts that 1. Familiar cases are without exception from artifactual category, and 2. That this artifactuality plays a significant role in design attribution in those familiar cases, whereas three, the cases of interest, design in nature, are apparently outside the artifactuality category and lack that often crucial characteristic. Inferences from design involve moving from design claims, whether presuppositions or conclusions, to other empirical matters e.g. empirical predictions. Some such inferences are in familiar cases unproblematic. Others are much less secure, given that designers can act in surprising ways. Depending upon the designer's values, motivations, capacities, conceptions, interpretations of situations, theories, etc., all the way up to worldviews, a designer may do any number of totally unanticipatable things, 
Thus, inferences to design in nature seem problematic, and even if such design is simply granted, it does not seem to lead far scientifically. 2. Gaps, non-gaps, and existence proofs. If we look more specifically at instances involving design, the fact, presence of design, often seems to be unconnected to any scientific leverage such instances generate. That contention may be supported as follows. Specific design cases seem to come in two varieties, with and without natural causal gaps in the production of the phenomena in question. Let us discuss them in turn. Gaps. Suppose that the first human landing on Mars was confronted with an undeniable Martian bulldozer, a clear case of design involving a natural causal gap, since nature's capabilities unaided by agency stop well short of producing bulldozers. Discovering this bulldozer, we would infer the existence of a suitable intelligence with suitable technical capabilities. We might even be able to infer various things about the designer from the bulldozer. We also might acquire substantial technical and technological knowledge from examination of the bulldozer and might even learn some new theoretical principles as well. However, except for matters closely linked to the fact of the gap, e.g the existence of the artisans, nearly everything we would learn would depend on the mere existence of the bulldozer, not on either its designness or its artifactuality. Suppose that by some wild freak of chance, random processes had produced that exact bulldozer, down to its very molecular structure. Whatever processes operated in the bulldozer, whatever principles its functioning exhibited, all would be exactly as manifest in the chance bulldozer as in the actually designed bulldozer, and anything that was there to be learned in the one would be there to be learned in the other. Beyond issues of mere artisan existence, whether the bulldozer is designed seems completely irrelevant on these specific counts. Non-gaps. Gapless design cases would seem to offer even less prospect of unique scientific fruitfulness. If there are no gaps, then whatever the phenomenon, there will be a natural explanation, at the immediate level, of its existence and its characteristics. The fact that it also was designed would offer no more insight into function, principles, or mechanisms than would its mere existence. Its existence and its operation would, back arbitrarily far, seem to be wholly explicable in mechanical, at least natural, terms. There might be features about it which implied the existence, ultimately, of an intelligence that designed it indirectly, but what scientific impact would that have? Design would seem to be simply an add-on layer. If there are no gaps, then aside from issues of ultimate origins, the design conclusion would seem to have no empirical implications not already implicit in the very structure, governance and course of nature itself. As before, any such natural phenomenon could constitute an existence proof, but even more than before, designness would simply play no role. Here is an interesting recent example. An astronomer concerned with observational field limitations of X-ray telescope lenses read an article discussing the structure of lobster eyes, more generally, macrurin eyes, and recognised it as a possible solution to the problem. Some X-ray telescope technology now being developed embodies lessons learned from phenomena, which the researchers apparently did not need to see as designed in order to learn the relevant lessons from it. Here again, it was an existence proof, 
not any inference from designness, which did the work. A deeper look. Perhaps this dismissal is a bit too quick and simple. Recall the earlier point that how conceptual components of science function and what demands might be legitimately made of them are not all of a kind. Unnuanced demands that the payoffs of incorporating design and related concepts into science be immediate and empirically specific may reflect insufficient appreciation of some of the philosophical complexities involved. But what other sorts of payoffs might design possibly offer? Following are several suggestions. 1. Contextual embedding. Christian theology played a significant, perhaps pivotal, role in the birth of modern science. The doctrines of creation and of divine voluntarism figured prominently in rational justifications of essential presuppositions, uniformity of nature, intelligibility of nature, necessity of observation, reliability of human sensory and cognitive faculties, permissibility of experiment and the like. The idea of design was crucial. Things that are designed are typically intelligible, embody consistency and coherence, and generally must be empirically examined to determine what the actual structure is. Indirectly then, design theories would tie into a deeper legitimation of science's presuppositions than is otherwise available and might thus afford one a worldview which was more organically unified in its upper levels. Such unification as a form of consilience sometimes even has evidential force. 2. Perspectives Taking nature or subsystems to be designed could also generate a substantively different perspective on reality. Since science cannot even in principle avoid taking some of its character and some of its conceptual resources from the larger conceptual matrix within which it is located, that could have significant scientific consequences. Deep principles concerning the nature of reality, including design, can affect such scientifically consequential matters as what sorts of theories might be considered legitimate, what sorts of conceptual resources are acceptable, what sorts of proposals can be considered plausible, what sorts of investigative questions are asked, what sorts of patterns in phenomena are even noticeable, let alone considered genuine and revealing, what sort of approaches are seen as legitimate and potentially fruitful and what criteria proposed answers must meet. As a broad example, think of the profound historical scientific consequences of replacing organic metaphors in science with machine metaphors. 3. Understanding On some views, understanding relevant truth is the deepest aim of science. Suppose that the fact of something being designed did not entail or predict any other empirical matters at all. That something is a product of design is nonetheless a substantive and upright bit of information about it, even if knowing that it was designed did not help us understanding its purpose, its history, its origin, its means of production, its producers, its operation, its incorporated principles, or much of anything else. Saying exactly why and how that is scientifically interesting is not easy. Still, any scientific investigator who managed to overlook the designness of, say, a Martian diesel bulldozer would be inept. Surely, exactly the same must be said about nature. Even were the designness of nature to have no further scientific implications, the fact of that design would nonetheless be a legitimately scientifically interesting fact and one which ought not be overlooked. 
existence. Genuine design, with or without gaps, would imply the existence of a designer or designers. If, in a Hoyle or Crick scenario, it appears that perfectly natural aliens designed and produced life as we know it, then that would be scientifically important, and could have significant further implications for research questions, aims, strategies, and permissible conceptual resources. But bare facts just concerning existence, even without such implications, are neither trivial nor scientifically irrelevant. Even if the only thing we learned was that such aliens had existed, this mere existence would have as much scientific propriety as the establishment of the existence of some new phylum on Earth, as in the recent lobster lip case involving Symbian Pandora, or the existence of some or any life form on Mars. After all, the discoverers of S. Pandora did not have to submit their reports to the Journal of Philosophy. Were it established that normal aliens, and not supernatural beings, had generated the bubble universe we inhabit, that absolutely would not be a matter of indifference to scientists, either qua-scientists or qua-human beings. And if empirically based investigations began suggesting that the bubble designing agent was not merely a natural alien, it is not completely obvious why that could properly be of interest to scientists only qua human beings and not qua scientists. It will, of course, be claimed that science could not establish the latter, although it should not be forgotten that some are unprepared to admit any limitation on science, those who do stipulate naturalistic limits for science, risk forcing science to miss or worse to deliberately ignore what would be the biggest scientific story ever. 5. Conceptual space. Being open to design offers a further possible scientific benefit. Design theories can allow conceptual space for gaps in the course of nature. There may or may not actually be such gaps. That is an empirical question, and design as such cuts neither way here. But paralleling an earlier point, if there are gaps, then any science which denies their existence will of necessity be either incomplete, offering no relevant explanation, of some aspects of the phenomenon in question, or mistaken, offering a full, gapless explanation where a gap in fact does exist. Some design theories could permit scientific recognition of gaps for what they are, whereas blanket prior rejection of the possibility of design, and with it the practical possibility of gaps, would deprive science of that flexibility. That would have consequences for the alleged self-correcting nature of science. In cases where the truth of the matter is non-natural, even where some favoured naturalistic theory discovered to be false, science would be forced by methodological naturalism to consider only naturalistic replacements, all of which would, ex hypothesis, also be mistaken. Furthermore, a doctrinaire commitment to methodological naturalism, conjoined with a commitment to the position that p the picture produced by science is correct and potentially complete, very nearly entails philosophical naturalism. Of course, many religious believers explicitly deny the completeness of science, contending that where wherever the supernatural is concerned, science should fall silent. But to fall silent where it should, and to speak where it should, science will need some means of identifying if, when, and where supernatural activity may be occurring, or has occurred. If science, however, can identify ifs, whens, and wheres of supernatural activity, then those cases for excluding design, which rest on claims that science cannot recognise the supernatural even in principle, are thereby undercut. 
unless relevant boundaries are simply stipulated arbitrarily or a priori, making a real case for some version of the separability thesis is going to be unavoidable for strict methodological naturalists. 6. Reverse engineering and tenacity. One of the major pragmatic objections to design theories is the worry that scientists, being a lazy depraved lot, would take the easy way out in the face of scientific difficulty. They would appeal to divine agency and thus would never discover material solutions, even when there were such. They would simply quit too soon. This is a legitimate concern and was expressed at least as early as the 1600s in the works of both Bacon and Boyle. But failure to recognise when it is time to quit is problematic as well. Crop circle enthusiasts who reject explanations involving human pranksters and are holding out for alien activity evidently do not know when to quit. Erstwhile inventors of perpetual motion machines who accuse physicists of accepting the second law merely as a lazy way of avoiding the hard work of inventing perpetual motion have also fairly clearly not learned when to quit. If life on Mars ultimately originated from microbes inadvertently carried to Mars by NASA probes, far future Martian scientists trying to figure out exactly how life spontaneously originated on Mars by chemical evolution will need to learn when to quit, when to give up on that research program. And if Hoyle, Crick and others are correct, biologists who are still trying to figure out how life emerged from non-life under early earth conditions in the time available, have failed to learn when to quit. Openness to design would permit recognition and flexibility were such warranted concerning when to quit, when to abandon degenerating research programs. If science were pursued within a design conceptual context, then if the designer were God, science literally would involve as Kepler allegedly put it, thinking God's thoughts after him. Science would, in a sense, be an attempt, extended attempt at reverse engineering. As some others have noted, that reverse engineering picture is suggestive. In some cases involving human artefacts, design theories are exactly what prevent investigators from quitting too soon. Manufacturers of cars, computers, chips, etc., frequently disassemble their competitors' new products looking for innovations, problem solutions, and the like. In that investigation, puzzling features are essentially thoroughly investigated precisely because it is assumed that the product is designed, and that the puzzling feature must be doing something significant, that it is not there simply by chance, for instance. One wonders if the ever-shrinking list of human vestigial organs would have gotten as large as it once was had researchers been working from a design perspective of humans as fearfully and wonderfully made. The tag functionless might have been attached a bit less blithely in that case, as might the term junk to DNA. 7. Empirical ground level Design has not been scientifically completely barren, even at ground level. Much of the data upon which Darwin built his case had been generated by investigators pursuing design conceptions. Concerning the allied concept of teleology, historian of science Timothy Lenoir recently observed, Teleological thinking has been steadfastly resisted by modern biology. And yet, in nearly every area of research, biologists are hard-pressed to find language that does not impute purposiveness to living forms. But resisted or not, in early 19th century Germany, a very coherent body of theory based on a teleological approach was worked out, and it did provide a constant fertile source for the advance of biological science on a number of different research fronts. John Headley Brook cites various other examples, 
and Harvey famously discovered circulation of the blood partly as a result of the conviction that certain structures in blood vessels were there for some reason. Some payoffs have not been confined to biology. Fermat's principle of least action seems to many straightforwardly teleological, yet Max Planck claimed, amid the more or less general laws which mark the achievements of physical science during the course of the last centuries, the principle of least action is perhaps that which may claim to come nearest to the ideal final aim of theoretical research, i.e. to condense all natural phenomena which have been observed and are still to be observed into one simple principle. Here, Planck has singled out something carrying at least the distant whiff of design and, in, and intent as coming closer to the ideal of science than does any of its competitors. Indeed, the whiff may not be all that distance. Elsewhere, Planck says, what we must regard as the greatest wonder of all is the fact that the most adequate formulation of this law creates the impression in every unbiased mind that nature is ruled by a rational, purposive will. On the other hand, design hostility has sometimes interfered with data acceptance and theory advance. For instance, just as some resisted Big Bang theory because it looked too much like a creation, some may resist fine-tuning empirical data because conceding genuine knife-edge fine-tuning threatens to stick one with deliberate supernatural planning as the only plausible explanation. Present prospects. Does science need to explicitly acknowledge design theories at this point? I do not know the answer to that question, but it may be that science already implicitly does so. Science presumes a cosmos which is uniform, coherent and intelligible. A universe in which beauty and elegance can be important markers of theoretical promise. Those are arguably characteristics which any science-permitting cosmos would have to have. A plausible characteristics of a world a mind would plan. And a characteristics which, in the absence of a planning mind, must be either reduced to subjective human projections or left to hang plausibly in mid-air as brute. That is why physicist and author Paul Davies, who is not a believer of any sort, so far as I know, recently remarked, science began as an outgrowth of theology, and all scientists, whether atheists or theists, accept an essentially theological worldview. If Davies is right, and I think he is, then why do so many scientists fail to recognise that fact? Why have anti-design commitments played such a prominent role both in biology, e.g. in connection with the initial enthusiasm in some circles for Darwin, and in cosmology, in many world theories embraced by some to circumvent fine-tuning arguments? Why are some, like Richard Dawkins, so hostile to design theories that they will assert that employing design theories is cowardly and dishonest, i.e. not merely a scientific failure, but a moral failure as well. I think that in some cases, the answer involves deep religious matters. But in other cases, it may be that the capital which science has gotten from theologically and design-shaped metaphysical principles wears the mask of the familiar and that science and many scientists live off that capital without knowing its source, much as some contemporary ethics live off the capital of historical theistic ethics, often without being aware of that fact. It is perhaps as Einstein once asked, what does a fish know of the water in which it swims all its life? Although science operates de facto in a deep design context, and is suffused with the structuring presuppositions of that context, does science need the sorts of overt empirical ground-level design theories recently advocated? 
Indeed, can design theories go beyond the contextual, the perspectival, the empirically indeterminate? Again, I do not know the answer to that question. However, I see no compelling justification for either hostility or prohibitions. Current intelligent design theories do not, it seems to me, have much to show at this point. But a remark of André Linde's in a different context is intriguing. A healthy scientific conservatism usually forces us to disregard all metaphysical subjects that seem unrelated to our search. However, in order to make sure that this conservatism is really healthy, from time to time one should take a risk to abandon some of the standard assumptions. This may allow us either to reaffirm our previous position or to find some possible limitation of our earlier point of view. Mm -hmm.